I want to talk a little about diversive disruption. Because disruption can appear somewhat predictable, but there's a period of time that can go by where it becomes highly unpredictable and critically diversive. And that's what we'll cover. So you've watched the cell phone, right? Remember when it was big, expensive, only sort of wealthy venture capitalists had them in movies. And it got smaller, 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 smaller. And then, if you remember, you get to about this point, and something different happened here, right? Because the next phone didn't do that. <laughs> and the glass phone was really different than the prior phones before it. And so this predictable process stopped at that moment. And when it stopped at that moment, suddenly, you know, there were kind of two companies that arrived that weren't even in the phone industry, and they completely dominated it within like four or five years. Out of nowhere, it seemed. And for the other phone companies, it was painful. Nokia went from a $100 billion company to $7 billion in just a few years. I mean, basically, out of the phone industry got sold off to Microsoft. And if you look and follow that path and try and understand it, it's a very difficult thing to do. And what you actually have to really do is look at another industry that was also evolving, and that was the computer industry, going from mainframes to mini computers to PCs to laptops to desktops to mobile internet, and then they come up with a phone. So when the phone arrives from their end of that chain, if you're in the old phone industry, it's really hard to compete. It's too late at that point because you'd have to be back integrated and doing cloud software and a whole bunch of other things that you wouldn't at all be prepared to do. And these kinds of diversive disruptions are incredibly powerful. They're very, very difficult to understand until they're actually sort of happening. And by then, it can often be too late, but it creates enormous opportunities for entrepreneurs. So now, you watch the phone happening, the iPhone 3, the 4, the 5, and then what happened with the 6? Right, just a little bit bigger. So now you can start to make a good prediction as to what the iPhone 10 looks like. And, right? But you know it's not going to happen that way, right? So again, we're going to go through a diversive disruption of some kind. And something really different is going to happen. And I think it's very difficult to predict. I'll take some, I'll take some cracks at it. This is my belief where the phone is going. I think it basically becomes a giant cockpit to the world. It just doesn't look like this. It's just one screen, and the apps kind of come on it, but you end up controlling the rest of the world through your phone. And we can see, like, glimpses of that. You know, I have one of these. How many people have one of these Nest thermostats? Have they made it to Canada? Oh, yeah, cool. Right? So I got one of these Nest thermostats. Now I control. I can take out my phone right now, and I can, you know, turn on my air conditioner or turn on my heat. And I've got a smoke detector, too, that's connected to the thermostat. So if my house was on fire right now, I'd get a message, and I'd know my house was on fire, which <laughs> probably wouldn't be very useful in Toronto. <laughs> Although I have a drop cam in my house, so I could at least watch it burning down. And um, so we have these at Singularity University. They're really cool. They're just they're sort of a telepresence. They're a screen, and I can get on it with my cell phone, and I can start roaming around the university. And we had one of the presidential advisors. Uh, come to Singularity University on, uh, on short notice. I think you were there too, Neil. And one of the faculty members couldn't make it. So he, Greg Marniak, rolled in on one of these into the meeting. And they're different than a phone because they physically take up a presence. I mean, you got to pull a chair out and they pull up to it. And for about two or three minutes, it was, it was really kind of awkward. But then, you know, the presidential advisor who had never seen one of these, sort of, he got it and then the conversation just continued until about halfway through the meeting when the battery died. <laughs> and then it was really awkward because there was just this thing that was there that wasn't doing anything anymore. And I actually had to pick it up and carry it out because it was so distracting. But when I came back in, everyone looked at me, Neil included, like I had carried a dead body out of the room. Um, so these devices, they kind of like, you know, if you think, well, how do they go downstairs? <laughs> well, they, they don't. What happens is, when you get near the stairs, you find like two or three of them waiting there, and then they ask you to carry them down. So you have to like, you know, carry them down, and you open up doors. But with this now, they're building one with a little arm on it. So you'll be able to open up the door. And I think within five years, we'll have them where they go 
up and down stairs. And so this is the first inning. So if you think like, what does inning six, seven, or eight look like? You know, we end up being able to really be somewhere else. And that's a weird thought and idea. I mean, you're physically there. You can raid the fridge. You might not be able to eat it, but you can do things like that. And what it means is that suddenly you could be in 50 places in a day. You might not want to do that, but today I can only get to like sort of three or four places. And so the world is actually about to change because of this device. And that's seriously and significantly different than a cell phone. And yet it's the same, the same medium.